Well, as Bill mentioned in the announcements uh, at the beginning of the service, we're having a historic churches tour here in Petaluma this afternoon. There are postcards uh, at the back of the church uh, with a little QR code on it if you want to purchase a ticket in advance, although I think they're selling them uh, at the door. Um, and, of course, uh, we are one of those featured historic churches. One of our assets here at St. John's is our long and, uh, well, somewhat illustrious, if uh, also slightly complicated history. And uh, so we get to benefit from uh, the broader... Uh, historical economy, so to speak, of Petaluma, where we like to uh, promote ourselves on the basis of our history. And uh, just this weekend alone, besides the Historical Churches Tour, which is part of the Historic Preservation Month organized by the Historical Museum, we also have uh, the tribute to American graffiti with various examples of mid-20th century Detroit kinetic sculpture on display. <laughs> and not too long ago, there was the Butter and Eggs Day parade, bringing lots of visitors to town to celebrate our agricultural uh, heritage and identity uh, a community that uh, prizes the past, or at least an idealized version of it. And that's really the question, I guess, uh, about the past uh, for us and for many people in our society right now as we recognize that uh, things seem to be coming to a pass, is what do we make of our past? <laughs> uh, do we want to double down on a myth about it and try to reassert uh, certain um, patterns of control from the past? on the basis of this idealized uh, story we tell ourselves about it? Or do we want to learn something from it that will enable us to meet an uncertain future with a broader perspective, a, a grounding and a sense of uh, a, a graciousness that has been present with us throughout all of the changes and transformations of history and yet continues to impel us to move forward, uh, leaving the past behind even as we uh, draw nourishment from its riches. So uh, our story from Acts today has Jesus' disciples uh, asking him at the conclusion of these 40 days since he rose from the dead when he's been uh, eating with them and appearing now and again in kind of peculiar and mysterious ways to instruct them further in the reality of the kingdom of God. And they sense also that things are building now to some kind of climax. They don't not really sure what it's going to be. But they ask him, Lord, is now the time when you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? It's now the time when you will act in some uh, mighty and supernatural way to help us to go back to the good old days. When David was king in Jerusalem and we ruled over our neighbors and were prosperous and uh, well defended and uh, were able to take advantage of uh, <coughs> a 
brief moment in time, it just so happens when both Egypt and Mesopotamia were kind of between empires. Um, so anyway, this is now the time. Is, are we going to um, get into our 57 Chevys and gas them up and ride into a future that will look uh, just like the good old days? Well, no. <laughs> So Jesus does have something in mind for them, but that's not it. He tells them to go back into Jerusalem and wait. Wait for something new to happen, which we'll learn more about next week when we celebrate Pentecost. Um, so they go back there, and it's quite interesting, you know, most people agree that Luke and Acts, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, were written by the same person. And uh, here in the first chapter of Acts, Jesus' mother Mary appears again. Uh, Mary, who was there in the first chapter of Luke, being visited by an angel and being told of an amazing birth that would happen through the power of the Holy Spirit. So here she is again. And uh, the author of Acts go to, goes to the trouble of naming the 11 uh, disciples, uh, sort of reconstituting the community by naming them all again. But also, he points out that there were some other women there with them including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Something new is going to happen through the power of the Holy Spirit that's going to reconstitute not only the community of disciples, but a new kind of family. A new kind of birth is going to take place in which we are all going to be brothers and sisters together, brothers and sisters of Jesus. So, <clears throat> we're still trying to get there, of course. Still trying to transcend our past, like the past of Petaluma for instance, which, you know, for all of the uh, charms and beauties of the civilization that was uh, established here by, among others, the members of St. John's Episcopal Church starting in 1856 and in the subsequent years on land taken through genocide from the southern Pomo and the Coast Miwok. Are we going to transcend that past and really become this family of brothers and sisters of Jesus? Petaluma, where uh, African Americans were explicitly excluded from the suburban community that was uh, created here in the 1950s, the time of American graffiti through practices of redlining so that the uh, exodus of people from the urban core of the Bay Area coming here to uh, inhabit this Elysian paradise here in the Petaluma Valley would be all white. Are we going to try to go back to that past? Or are we going to transcend it through the power of the Holy Spirit to create something new, a family in which we are all brothers and sisters with Jesus? Well, it depends on the Holy Spirit. And that's what the gospel is preparing us to understand today. Jesus 
uh, on the night before he dies, speaks to his disciples after washing their feet, give them a living demonstration of the kind of community that they are to become once he has returned to his father. He then speaks to them at considerable length and concludes with this prayer in which he prayer, prays for them that they all may be one as he and the Father are one. And it's a prayer like uh, so much of his discourse at the supper. These words that he pours out, inviting them to communion with him and with God in a life that is shared with him and with God through the Holy Spirit. It's a prayer that is replete with the language of gift. You have given them to me, he says to God, speaking of us. That's who we are, God's gift, not to the world, but to Jesus. People who are given as a gift to the world, not to dominate the world, but to serve the world through the power of communion with it. This prayer that Jesus offers is what we might call a Eucharistic prayer. There is no Eucharist at the Last Supper in John, but there is this outpouring of words of thanksgiving laying down the tracks for a Eucharistic way of life, a way of life grounded in the gift that is life, a gift from which we live, not a world to be contested over, to be appropriated and manipulated and controlled, to our own advantage or the advantage of our group with which we identify, but a world to be loved and known as a gift, to be received and blessed and broken and shared with everyone. This is the life of the Holy Spirit life of communion with God and with Christ, the life that we have been given to by Jesus on the cross. So can we approach our lives with that sense of giftedness that everything that happens, even our suffering, even our struggles, even the things about the world that we find so frightening and threatening and incomprehensible, the violence and the injustice and the cruelty and the indifference and the sheer randomness of it all, can we receive it all in the spirit of a gift, trusting that God will renew and transform it with a power that was made known to us in the resurrection of Christ. God's infinite power to recreate the gift and renew it and give it again in love. Can we live in that spirit of gratitude and generosity? together, one, as Christ and God are one.